And of course, it will not be as lucrative, but hey, we're getting paid in eternal wages. Amen. Some might ask and say, why in the world, as you can go ahead and start my slide presentation this morning, why in the world would you go to the Philippines to minister to kids in the Philippines? Because we are called to obey God's commands. He said, well, I don't remember reading in the Ten Commandments, thou shalt go to the Philippines and minister to the street kids. No, but there are other commands that God has given us. I talked last week about a new command I have given you, and that is to love one another, and that one another in the Greek is another of the same mother or another of the same genealogy. So that would be us loving one another as the body of Christ. And we've, we're challenging you to truly love each other, not have a feeling or emotion, but give action and, and, and effort and, and let it be a verb like it is to minister to the people around you that you love, the people you come in contact with. God calls us to love one another the way he loves us. Now, there's something very interesting, and, and, and I'm just going to throw it out there for you today, and you can mill on it, and you can think about it, and you can meditate about it, but it's interesting. He tells us when we are to love one another, it says you are to love one another as I, Christ, have loved you. Now, I want you to keep that in your mind. But there's another command that he gave us. We know there are three great commands. There we go. Now I'm good. There are three great commands. First of all, you are to love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, and your strength. We know that that's the first and greatest commandment, that we are to love the Lord. And that's obvious, and I believe that people here love the Lord. But the second command he gave in this particular passage is, you are to love your neighbor as yourself. And there is no commandment greater than these, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, and your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. Now notice he says, when I'm loving my neighbor, this is people in proximity to me, not of the same genealogy of me, but in proximity to me. When I love my neighbor, I am to love my neighbor as I love myself. There is a difference between the love we have for the koinonia, for the church, for the ecclesia. There's a difference between that love that we have one for another and love for the world or love for our neighbor. And the interesting part is, in this day and time, the world is our neighbor. I mean, used to, think about this, just, just in many of your lifetimes, a few of you who are here, in just your lifetime, the world has become our neighborhood. Because previous to air flight, it was long sailing trips across the ocean. Sometimes you'd be a month getting somewhere. And many people never traveled very far. They lived their whole life in a small little sphere of influence. But now, for instance, I just drove to Cleveland, Tennessee, drove from Cleveland, Tennessee to Miami, Florida, from Miami, Florida, back up to Cleveland, Tennessee, and back down here to Jackson. That's just in a car. I can jump in a plane and be in Puerto Rico in a couple hours. I can jump in a plane and be in California in a couple hours. I can jump on a plane in quite a few more hours. I can be to the Philippines, and I've been there. And it's not any. That's a long flight. I mean, you fly to Tokyo, and then you jump on another plane, fly another four or five hours down there, and I've been to the Philippines, been through Manila and up into the mountains to the Bible College there. And uh, it's a long flight, but... but in, in, in a matter of a day, I could be in the Philippines. I, I flew to China. In a matter of a day, I could be in China, for goodness sakes. Russia. The world is our community. So I want to talk to you today about loving your neighbor. Now, we tend to think of our neighbor as the person next door. But I'm going to ask you a simple question. If God has commanded us to love our neighbor... Do you know your neighbor's name? Don't answer that. If you don't know your neighbor's name, if you've never even met your neighbor, you're not loving your neighbor. 
I'm letting you in on a clue. I'm just going to let you in on something. You're not loving your neighbor. If you've never even met them, you don't know their name, you don't know anything about their life, you're not loving your neighbor. It's uncomfortable sometimes. We like to be in our little insulated worlds. We don't like to, you know, but the neighbor right beside us, thank God, through, through just loving my neighbor, I've made a disciple of Christ who is now serving the Lord. Loving your neighbor, that's the person next door. It's the person in proximity to you, and I'll show you what I'm talking about. The truth is that many people are looking to the government when I, I agree with the words of Hubert H. Humphrey who said this, the impersonal hand of government can never replace the helping hand of a neighbor. During hurricanes and during disasters and everything else, even if you saw some of the fires in California, they showed one man in an interview and they were talking to him and they said, so let me get this straight. You were helping your neighbor get things out of his house while your house was burning. He said, yes, because my house was engulfed with flames. There's nothing I could do, but I could help my neighbor get some of his things out. We've seen it in hurricanes and especially here in the south in tragedies and tornadoes where neighbors who are going through a tragedy themselves lend a hand with whatever resources they have to take care of each other. And many times, it's not the government who raced to their aid and saved them in that greatest moment of need. It was a neighbor. It was someone in proximity to them. You know, I saw this one billboard. That love thy neighbor thing, I meant that. <laughs> you know, when God commands us, you got to remember he gave commands. Commands are not suggestions. Commands are, you go do this. Some of you say, well, I don't, I'm not feeling it. I don't care whether you feel it or not. Okay? I don't, I, God didn't say, well, if you feel like it. He said, you're to love me, you're to love one another, and you're to love your neighbor. Now, we're going to talk further about this difference between loving your neighbor as yourself and loving one another as Christ has loved us. And I want you all to chew on that a little bit. Just think about it, study it, dig into it a little bit. But we're going to talk about that more later. But, but the problem is people. You know, I love mankind as people I can't stand. You know, some of us, oh, I know we're to love all people. It's just that particular one that I'm having trouble with. You know? And, and, and we want to make it abstract when God's going to put it in your face today, okay? I'm, I'm through, God through me is going to put it in your face. So if you get mad at me, you're mad at God, okay? Not, I'm not God. I didn't say that. But I'm saying that God is speaking through me today and he's going to get in your face a little bit. And if you get mad at what I have to say, I'm only saying what he said. And I'm reiterating that to you. And I want to talk to you about loving your neighbor. And it's defined in Luke chapter 10, verse 25 through 37, the Good Samaritan. And those of you who know the Bible are like, oh, don't go there. Do not go there. Why? Because, you see, when we look at that passage of Scripture up there earlier, you've got wiggle room. But when you get to the Good Samaritan, there's no wiggle room. You see, when we read this passage of Scripture and we read about the man who fell into the, the, these thieves and they robbed him and they left him there for dead, beaten and battered and stripped of his goods, uh, and along comes a priest and the priest goes to the other side of the street and goes on about his business. Then the Levi comes and he does the same. Now, you need to understand the priest was someone who's commissioned to serve. The Levi was one of, of the lineage of the priesthood, and yet both of them walked on the other side of the street and avoided their neighbor. Because it goes on down, and Jesus asked, which of these three was a neighbor to this man? So, see, conversely, you got to turn around and realize that all three of them were neighbors according to proximity, but only one was a neighbor according to his actions. And Jesus looks and he says, now I, I love this quote that I saw this week. Love thy neighbor as thyself, but choose your neighborhood. <laughs> That's not biblical, by the way. By the way, don't, no, 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 no. Don't take pictures of this and go, my pastor said, 
Oh, I didn't do that. There you go. Love thy neighbor as thyself, but choose your neighborhood. You see, there's a lot of churches that that's what we're doing. We're choosing our neighborhood. Well, this is our target. This is our target audience. This is who we want. We don't want drug addicts. We don't want prostitutes. We don't want street people. We don't want poor. We don't want all that mess and all that struggle and all that difficulty. We want a bunch of more people like us, you see. That's our target, target audience. So we're going to choose our neighbors. We want people like us. I don't have to help people out of the ditch like me because they got the means to help themselves out of the ditch. But when I, got, when I have poor around me, when I have suffering, when I have hurting people around me, then wouldn't you know it, God wants me to help them. You see, because my neighbor is a matter of proximity. Why go to the Philippines? As a missionary, it's because you made the mistake of going to the Philippines. And when you went to the Philippines and you saw the need, suddenly those little Filipino children became your neighbor, you see? And then as you find these neighbors wherever you go, and, and something that I, I wrote for this sermon today, the priest, the Levite, and the good Samaritan, you see, were not allowed to choose who would be their neighbor for that was a matter of proximity. They did, however, make a choice as to whether they would love their neighbor Mark chapter 12, 31 gives us latitude and interpretation, but the passage of Luke 10 gives no room for manipulation of the text. It's right in your face. Who you come in contact with becomes your neighbor. You see, but, well, you say, well, no, now wait a minute. I mean, it's maybe talk about your neighborhood. No, it's not, because the Samaritan was traveling just like this man. It was not his neighborhood. It was not his place. It was not next door. It's wherever you go. The Great Commission actually says this, while going, preach the gospel. Wherever you go, whatever you do, whoever you come in contact with, you are to be the spoken expression of God's message and the living expression of God's truth in your life. You are to be missionaries and witnesses wherever you go. Those God puts in our paths become the neighbors he desires us to love. Some of you are sitting here and you just this week, and you're going to say, Pastor, how did you know that? But this week, you see, God is listening. He's listening when you're praying. He's also listening when you're complaining. He's listening when you're griping. And some of you, even this very week, have said, God, I don't know why this person is even in my life. It could be that God put them in your life for you to love them. What? <laughs> love them? I don't even like them. I mean, I, they have been put in my life. I didn't ask for them. They just showed up. They were just there in my way. I mean, this good Samaritan, the Levite and the priest, I, don't, I ain't got time for that. I do not have time for that. I got things to do. I got places to go. I got stuff to do for God. Watch it now, Pastor, you're meddling. Yes, I'm meddling. I can't tell you the times. Look, I'm a human being. There's times when, you know, a situation arises and there's someone in need and, and I'm the pastor and I'm supposed to do it and my wife gets to see me in those treasured moments when I'm going, yeah. I do not want to do this right now. I've got a ton of stuff to do. I don't have time for this. Hello? Yes, I'll be right there. <laughs> you know? Get in your car, driving there in the name of Jesus, help me, God help me. Praying and all. And sometimes, sometimes you feel like, and God, it's their own stupidity and everything else. And the whole time he's going, I'm telling you to love them. And I'm telling you to love them. I'm telling you to love them. I don't want to love them. I want to slap them. We would much rather love by proxy. Oh, I'll give a little money to Ashley and she can go love them for me. Hallelujah. 
glory to God, I, I'll give some money to stew pot or, or, or we will go and hallelujah, let them love them because I'm just not into that. But God needs us to be a fulfillment of love in proximity to people. It's even the message of the video that was given. You know, I, I've heard that Jesus loves me, but I, I don't see it. I don't understand it. How do they many times see it and understand it? It is by us interpreting it for them by expressing it to them in our actions. So what does it mean to love our neighbor? What does it mean? <laughs> okay, so I've got to do this. So what, what I have to do, Pastor? Well, there's a Jewish existential philosopher who made a quote. Now, I don't, you got to understand, existentialism is not the gospel, but the existential philosophers really looked at the contrast of Christianity and what we say and what we do, and they didn't understand, and, and they kind of call for authenticity. They called her hand. Okay? But, but notice what he says. What you must do is love your neighbor as yourself, and there's no one who knows your many faults better than you. But you love yourself notwithstanding, and so you must love your neighbor no matter how many faults you see in him. And have you ever noticed this? The neighbor that bugs you the most is the one that reminds you of your shortcomings? I want to say that again. The neighbor that you most abhor, that you most abhor and hate is the one who reminds you of your own shortcomings. You're annoyed with yourself. The last thing you want is somebody else in your life showing you stuff you're annoyed with yourself over. And sometimes God brings people in your life that has the same mess you've got so that you can see how bad your mess is. Somebody needed to hear that today. Someone needs to see it from the other side and understand that the people who are loving you just how big a task that is when you're having to give the love instead of receive it and when they're demanding it even. But the problem is, and we're going to deal with this later. I don't have time for this today. I could preach for the next couple of hours and get you all out of here about 5 o'clock, but I go pick up my grandkids up on the way to Memphis, so we got to get by on the road again. But anyway... You shall love your neighbor as yourself, but loving yourself isn't something we talk about very much in Christianity, and it really isn't, because we want to be humble. Now look, humility is not humiliation. Humility is not thinking of yourself as nothing. It just says don't think of yourself as more than you ought. And I'm not unimportant. I'm not something that doesn't matter. Now, I'm not afraid to say that because I mattered enough for Christ to die on the cross for. You see, I'm not, un I'm not worthless. I'm of great worth. But I'm not worth more than my neighbor. I'm not worth more than the world. I'm not worth more than the other people in my life. You see, don't look at yourself more highly than you ought, as it tells us in 1 Corinthians. It doesn't say don't give yourself any worth. Don't, don't, don't think of yourself as anything. I'm a child of the Most High God. We are, we are princes and princesses of God. His blood flows in our veins. We are co-heirs with Christ Jesus. One of the things I know Brother Jared is with us this morning that runs the Women's Teen Challenge Ministry in Brandon. And one of the things you have to get into those ladies is what? You are a princess of God. You are a child of God. You're not worthless. You matter. You're special to God. He loves you. You've been treated like dirt. But God's refined that dirt and now he's anointed it and he's made you one of his own. You see, God works within our lives, but we don't want to talk about that. But the truth is, you should love yourself. I don't love myself that much. Anybody else struggle with that? Anybody ever look in the mirror and go, you idiot. You know, does anybody else look in the mirror and go, you are dumb as a brick? You know, and why do you do this stuff? Maybe you don't talk to yourself like that. And, and, and you struggle with your, your image of self. 
We focus on loving our neighbors so much and we assume you already know how to love yourself, but do we really know how to love ourselves the way God wants us to love? See, God wants us to love us with the love that he's giving. You see, loving one another, I believe, includes myself, and that's with the love that Christ gave to us, which is, I loved loved you when you were unlovely. You see, I've given you mercy. I've given you grace. Kind of a tongue-in-cheek author, a French author from the 1700s says, if you must love your neighbor as yourself, (laughs) it is at least as fair to love yourself as your neighbor. I mean, he wanted to kind of turn it around and say, well, if I'm supposed to love my neighbor as myself, that means I can love myself, so I guess loving myself is a good thing. But, But some of us, now some of you, on the other hand, you're not having a problem loving yourself. I'm not going to look at anybody, just in case you're struggling. But some of you, someone else in the audience will probably look at you and go, uh-huh, he's talking about you. Because you're not afraid to love yourself. Oh, you do. With all your mind, your soul, your strength, your resources, and everything you got, you love you. And there is nothing left for anybody else. Some of you know one of them, don't you? <laughs> Hallelujah, the world. Don't you know the universe? I am the axis of the universe. Everything revolves around, you know, evolved and revolves around me. But our job is to love others without stopping to inquire whether or not they are worthy. That's even yourself. You say, Pastor, I'm not worthy. You're right. Neither am I. Neither is anyone else. You see, I'm not, I'm made worthy through Christ. See, I'm worthy, but I'm not worthy in my worth. I'm worthy in his worth, you see. I'm worth something, but I'm worth that in Christ, not in myself. I'm worthy in Christ. But some of you say, well, you know, I, I, I know what I should do, then just do it. I like what... Uh, C.S. Lewis says, do not waste time bothering whether you love your neighbor. Act as if you did. And as soon as we do this, we find one of the great secrets. When you're behaving as if you love someone, you will presently come to love him. Fake it till you make it. (laughs) If some of you don't really love me, just act like it. (laughs) And just keep acting like it. And then maybe one day... You will. Now, he goes on and he writes a little further. He says, love tends to, and I put this, love tends to be contagious, and I'm sorry I, I didn't center my slide there. When you are behaving as if you loved someone, you will presently come to love him. If you injure someone you dislike, you will find yourself disliking him more. I want to stop for a moment. You see, when you've done ill towards someone, you're going to tend to like them less. Why? You've got to justify what you just did. Now, I'm just breaking it down for you. I don't want you to miss it. I want it to hit you square in the forehead. You see, when you don't like someone and you do something to them, you, gotta just, you have to justify what you just did so you're going to find more fault with them so that you can justify your actions. But when you start loving them as a verb, you will start loving them as an emotion you'll start disliking them less. Like I tell people when they come and they want to beef and bark about somebody and they're all so concerned about them and their actions and everything else, I say, well, the first thing we're going to do, let's just take a week and pray for them. No, Pastor, that was not what I was planning. I was planning for you to take action. I want something to happen to this person. Well, we want something to happen to them. We want God to move in their life and God to change them and transform them. So first of all, we're going to pray for a week. No, that's not what I came here for. I want my ounce of flesh, and I want it now. You know? A husband, a loved one, or a wife, or a cousin, or a, or a whoever, or a neighbor. And you know, when you, look, when you look at the scriptures, and you can study this for time's sake, I won't read it. But in Matthew chapter 5, verses 38 through 48, Jesus gives me all these descriptions of these very unlovable people. He said... Now, what have you done if you love those that love you? The world does that. The world does that. 
Now, I want to take it on the other, the flip side of that. People who are feeling worthless, people who, who accomplish things, people who have possessions, they tend to feel better about themselves. They tend to, not always. But the people who don't seem to have and, and don't seem to be the prettiest and the smartest and the, everything else, they tend to struggle with the self-image. But you see, I believe in the same way God is saying, don't do like the world that only the people who are rich, only the people who have, have any sense of self-worth. Every one of I want you to know you are not a victim. You are a victor through Christ Jesus. And I am sick and tired of people sitting around feeling and thinking that they are worthless and that they are nothing. You are not. You are a creation of God and he values you. We're going to be preaching more about the spirit of Belial or Belial, which is that spirit of worthlessness and it is smiting our community here and our surroundings and our neighbors, people who feel like they're worthless and worth nothing more than the way they are living their lives when God has called you to much greater purposes. Loving your neighbor. So even myself can be quite unlovely, but God has called us to love very unlovely people with the love he showed to us when we are so unlovely. When we were so unlovely. It is with grace and mercy that God loves us. And we are to express that same type of love to one another and your neighbor. As our musicians come this morning and our men prepare to pass out communion this morning. I want you to understand something about this communion a heart filled with love has no room for hate. God's love is transformative for those who receive and give it. And I think both, both transactions must take place. You must receive God's love and for it to be complete, you must give God's love. It's like the enter button. The message is there, but you can't fully digest it until you hit the enter button and you love another. And then it's a part of your system. It's a part of who you are. It becomes a part of your identity in Christ Jesus when you hit the enter button and you love another person. Love never fails. Some of you are just fishing with the wrong bait. You're fishing with condemnation. You're fishing with judgment. When you ought to be fishing with love. You ought to be loving the unlovely. Showing them a love that they don't understand. Not a love like the world has. I mean, they already have that. They've already seen that. They already know that's not the answer. They need the love that God has called us to give. To love the unlovely. And you say, how do you tie that to communion? Well, in Luke chapter 22 and verse 19 through 20, we read the passage of scripture. And he took the bread... And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise the cup after that he had eaten, saying, The cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. You see, when we celebrate communion, we are celebrating the covenant between Christ Jesus and God and us. This is the covenant. Every now and then, when there's a contractual issue, what do you do? You pull out the contract. You call the other interested party in, and you sit down, and you do a little negotiation, a little arbitration, and you go, now, the contract says, these are the stipulations, these are the guidelines, these are the rules, you're violating the rules, we need to get back to the contract, we need to do what the contract has said. Understand something. Contract is a construct of covenant. I mean, it is based in covenant. That's what you are covenanting with someone when you contract with them. And so what happens in this covenant with God is, I'm afraid this morning he's going, and before we re-sign on the line, let's go over those rules. You are to love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, and your strength. You are to love one another as I have loved the church 
as I have loved you, you are to love one another. Oh, no, yeah, there's another one. And you are to love your neighbor as yourself. So this morning as I was sitting preparing for this sermon, I thought, how fitting that we are celebrating the covenant. A covenant of a Savior who said in Mark 15, 16, and if you love me, you keep my commandments. If you love me, you abide by the stipulations of the covenant, of the contract. I came and I gave my life for you and I ask you to give your life for me. And here's how I want you to give it. I want you to love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, and your strength. I want you to love one another as I have loved you and I want you to love your neighbor. That's how I want you to live your life to honor me. That's pretty simple. I don't think it's real complicated. Three commands. Can you say them with me? What's the first one? Love who? Then we love who else? One another. And then third, we love our neighbor. It's not real complicated. He said, this is a covenant. And you know what? I've already done it. That's what Jesus said. Matter of fact, I'm fixing to prove to you my love. I'm fixing to lay my life down for you. I'm going to die for you. I'm going to show you just how serious I am about this covenant. Jesus, I hold within my hand the implement that represents your body, your flesh and blood, your body that was given to the torturer's whip, your hands and wrists that were given to the nails, your back to the rugged cross, your brow to the crown of thorns, your face to the fist of your tormentors, your beard being ripped out by their hands as they accused you and mocked you, as they spat in your face and it ran down your face. You were living out, love your neighbor. You were living it out when you spoke to your disciples and you said, look, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be going here soon, but don't worry. I'm coming back and everything's going to be okay. You proved it to them. You loved them. And I know you loved God because in the garden you even cried out and said, God, there's got to be some other way. But God said there wasn't. And you said, nevertheless, then, your will. So God did it. Would you stand with me? And he's asking you this morning, will you covenant with me to give your life as I've given mine. For some of you, there is a person that God just keeps zipping across in front of your spirit. And he's telling you, I want you to love them. Lord Jesus, I come to you and I thank you. As I partake of this bread, it, it's more than just a ritual that we go through. It, it, this is a covenant. And you called me to abide by this covenant in, in three ways. To love you, to love my brother and sister in Christ, and to love the world or my neighbor, which can even be the Philippines. God, whoever you put in my path. And God, right now, as I partake of this bread, I'm going to commit something to you, and, and I, know you're, I, know, I know you. You're going to put somebody in my path this week and you're going to ask me to love them and I'm not going to want to. I'm just not going to want to. But you loved me when you shouldn't have. But you did. And so God, I'm going to give myself to this covenant. And I'm going to love my neighbor. I'm going to love my brother. I'm going to love you, God. I covenant with you that I'll give my life to your principles and what you've said. In Jesus' name, let us partake of the bread. And now, the wine. You gave your life. My life is my time. God, even in our schedules today, I know that time is precious. 
And for some of us, it's going to require our time this week. Time we don't want to give. Time that is already precious and short, but God, you took time to leave heaven to come here to die on the cross for me. You took 33 years and came and were, you were born as a child and lived and suffered through this earth and suffered at the hands of men and died for me. God, the least I can do is give of my time and my energies to your kingdom's working. God, you're gonna present something to me this week that's gonna take some of my time. And I, I pray God that in Jesus' name, I'll honor the covenant and I'll say, God, I'm gonna stop here and I'm gonna do what you said. I'm gonna love my brother or my sister. I'm, I'm gonna love my neighbor. And I thank you and I praise you, Lord, that you are willing to come and to give your life for me, your time, your energy, your everything. God, you gave it all. So God, I covenant with you that I'm yours. And so this is how you mean for me to live. And that's what I'm gonna start doing. And God, when I act out of line, I pray your Holy Spirit will tap on my heart and remind me, wait a minute. You're not living according to the covenant. And I pray in your precious name that when we partake of this grape juice that represents the blood that you shed for us that we'll take it very seriously and that in this very week the body and the blood of Jesus Christ will manifest itself within us here on this earth in a tangible, observable proximity way to those who are lost and don't know you and even those who are wandering and struggling and I pray this in the precious name of Jesus Amen. Let us partake. Now, folks, levity sometimes can lessen the power of a message. But let there be no mistake this morning. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, and your strength. Love one another as I have loved you. And love your neighbor. And this week, God's going to give you an opportunity. In Jesus' name, God bless you and His Spirit be upon you. Hallelujah.